Tonight, I am thrilled to welcome you all to our evening about Frederick Douglass with our very special guest, Professor David Blight, the Sterling Professor of History and the Director of the Gilder Lamon Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition at Yale University. My name is Bartley Grosser-Richter and I'm the founder of Munich Dialogues on Democracy. And relevant to our program tonight, I'm also the current president of the Yale Club of Germany. Tonight's program is a cooperation between Munich Dialogues on Democracy, the Bavarian American Academy at America House, and the Yale Club of Germany. So welcome to the Munich Dialogues community and to the network of Yale alumni in Germany and across Europe and in the US. For those of you not familiar with the BAA, the Bavarian American Academy was founded in 1998 and it provides a scholarly network for researchers working on North America and inter-American relations in the fields of cultural studies and the social sciences. They organize annual conferences and summer schools, they sponsor regional symposia and lectures, and they award postgraduate fellowships. So what you might not know is that they sponsor a fellowship to Yale every year. For two months, an outstanding graduate student from one of the universities in Bavaria is awarded time at Yale at the Gilder Lehrman Center and the contact person is none other than Professor Blight. The Yale Club of Germany is proud to have been able to financially support this program over the past few years. And if you're a Yale alum watching now, uh, this is an excellent opportunity to give back. Um, for your tax deductible donations can very specifically go to support this program and these students. So feel free to contact me directly if you would like more information. As my partners tonight can attest, I have wanted to host Professor Blight since we started Munich Dialogues in 2018. So this is a special treat for me tonight. Um, if you're wondering why, I think Blight said it best himself in his Pulitzer Prize winning book. So I'd like to quote, why am I a slave is an existential question that anticipates many others like it in human history. Why am I poor? Why is he so rich and she only his servant or chattel? Why am I hated for my religion, my race, my sexuality, the accident of my birth? Why am I a refugee with no home? Why does my color define my life? Douglas's story represents so many others over the ages. And I would personally add, I think it's totally relevant as a mirror to what's going on in many places around the world today. So you can find more information about Munich Dialogues on Democracy at our website, which is dialoguesondemocracy.com. And you can sign up to receive our newsletter and join the community and be informed about our activities. If you would like to ask questions tonight, that is possible. You can either use the YouTube chat function, we'll be monitoring that, or you can send an email to the address event at americahouse.de. And the spelling is German, event at A-M-E-R-I-K-A-H-A-U-S dot D-E. Our super team over there will be monitoring those and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible in the time that we have tonight. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us again and hand over to our moderator this evening, Professor Klaus Benisch, who is Professor of English and American Studies at Munich's Ludwigs Maximilian University. And he also happens to be the former director of the BAA. So over to you, Professor Benisch, and thank you all. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Bartley. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for a conversation with our special guest, Professor David Blight. Uh, before I move on to introduce our main speaker tonight, I want to briefly mention that this is not the first uh, collaboration between the Yale Club Germany, the America House, the Bavarian American Academy, and LMU's American Studies program. We are very grateful that the lecture series Dialogues on Democracy that Bartley Krosserichter, the president of the Yale Club Germany, regularly co-organizes with the BAA has turned out a huge success and that we at American Studies at LMU were able to occasionally join in with these events has proved to be a very rewarding experience. The series has featured some of the best thinkers and scholars of the United States. And so if you are not yet signed up for any of the newsletters of the participating institutions, I highly recommend that you do so in order to not to miss uh, any of the upcoming lectures and events. I also want to thank the Bavarian American Academy for its relentless efforts to make American studies in Bavaria a much more lively, interesting, and better known academic field, not least by co-organizing co and sponsoring events such as this one. 
and to boost cooperation and synergy among Bavarian scholars interested in American society and history within, but also outside of academic institutions and universities. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a particular pleasure to introduce to you the class of 1954 and Sterling Professor of American History at Yale University, David William Blight. <clears throat> David is also the director of Yale's Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition, and the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. David's association with American studies in Munich actually goes way back to the early 1990s when he taught as a senior Fulbright professor at LMU's America Institute. While many friendships and close ties with colleagues and academic institutions have sprung from this uh, time in Munich, occasionally it was also fraught with adventure and anxiety. Uh, upon his arrival here, David had just worked, uh, started working on his second book, Race and Reunion, uh, when a student with mental health issues set fire to the wing of the university where David's office was located. From what I remember, it was only due to David's scholarly bravery that he managed to rescue parts of the manuscript and thereby was able to finally complete this masterpiece of a study in American cultural memory. Race and Reunion, uh, the Civil War in American Memory, which was published by Harvard University Press uh, in 2001, won seven book awards and paved the way for David's eventual transition from Amherst College to Yale University. Many more books, monographs, as well as edited volumes and new editions of classical works of American writers have since followed. The list is too long and too diverse to be honored adequately in a brief introduction. It should not go unnoticed, however, that even before his latest book to date, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which is the topic of tonight's talk and ensuing conversation, and which has won eight book awards, among them a prestigious Pulitzer Prize, David has become one of America's foremost public historians and a relentless interpreter of African-American history its heroes and all too often forgotten voices that persevered in their struggle for survival and visibility. As director of the Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition, David has dedicated a considerable amount of, of his time to draw attention to this important history, but also to the ways in which the slaves themselves have struggled, rebelled and often overcome the predicament of their special place in American history. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, the 2018 Pulitzer Prize winner, Professor David Blight. David, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Klaus. Um, in fact, I can't thank you enough for that kind introduction. Uh, the truth is the fireman that night of the fire there in Munich, uh, wouldn't let me into the building at first. They finally did. I didn't actually, well, I rescued my stuff as soon as they let me, but as you may remember, it was the huge concrete stone thickness of the walls <laughs> in that building that actually saved my office and all the research notes I had started for that book, Race and Reunion. It's now a, a great story I can laugh about we weren't laughing at the time, though, were we? Anyway, uh, Klaus Benish has been a great friend ever since the early 90s when I had that privilege to spend a year teaching in Munich. And we've had Klaus over here to both Amherst and Yale. Klaus has been a fellow here at the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale for the study of slavery and abolition. He's also been a part of a working group we've done here. So I've exploited Klaus every chance and his brilliance every chance I've gotten. I want to speak uh, with and through Frederick Douglass right to your theme of this series about democracy. Indeed, the whole world's talking about democracy in one way or another, it seems, and it should be. Uh, one of the greatest voices about democracy ever in America was Walt Whitman as I'm sure many of you know, and in his magnificent poem, Song of Myself, he wrote, 
I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. That was a powerful definition of democracy by Whitman the poet in verse. But what I'm gonna contend here is that in prose, I'm not saying he was a Walt Whitman, no one else was. But in prose, Frederick Douglass was probably America's greatest prose poet of democracy in the 19th century. Now, who Douglas was deserves a, a brief comment, at least. <laughs> uh, he lived the, almost the whole trajectory of the 19th century. He was born a slave in 1818, uh, out on a, in a remote place on the Eastern shore of Maryland. He was born along the Tuckahoe River. He spent 20, the first 20 years of his life as a slave, 11 of those years out on the remoteness of the Eastern shore, that's east of the Chesapeake Bay. But he spent nine of those years in Baltimore as an urban slave where he encountered a maritime life of the great harbor of Baltimore. We encountered a more cosmopolitan environment where he learned to read and write uh, uh, very well and where he was living amidst, at least, a free Black community, which was much larger than the slave community of the city of Baltimore. Had Douglas not had this experience of living in Baltimore and taking the kinds of work and jobs he had, of getting involved in three or four different churches, of actually engaging even in a debate society, we might never know, have known about it. He probably would never have escaped. He escaped at age 20. He will spend nine years of his life uh, up until the late, uh, well, the 1847, as uh, a fugitive slave. Uh, his freedom was not purchased for him by his British friends until 1847, uh, when he made his first extended tour of the British Isles, which profoundly changed his life. He became uh, the most well-traveled, uh, the most sought after, perhaps the most brilliant of American abolitionists, both as an orator and as a newspaper editor. He published his own newspaper, excuse me, dropped some notes, <laughs> sorry. He published his own newspaper uh, for some 16 years. Uh, he was a great journalist. But above all, Douglas became, and here's where the idea of him being our prose poet comes in. Above all, Frederick Douglass became a writer, an amazing writer who never set foot one single day of his life in a traditional schoolroom. Uh, he came by language by being taught first by his mistress or his owner or his owner's wife in Baltimore, and then he took to language uh, like children take to whatever they're good at. And it's a long story of how Douglas managed to master language, uh, both oratorical and written. The oratory came first, the writing was much harder. Um, but suffice to say, he became one of the great writers of the 19th century. He wrote millions of words. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography in three different versions over time. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of the shorter form uh, editorials, political essays in his newspaper and in other journals as well. He became a great essayist. And then there are the speeches, literally thousands of speeches. And all of Douglas's great speeches, you may have heard of his 4th of July speech, and there are many, many, many others, I'll quote from a couple in a minute, um, were written out in a text form. All of Douglas's greatest speeches, dozens of them, exist in text. He was not just the preacher who could stand up in a hall and blow out the lights off the top of his head. He could do some of that too, but he was a writer. <laughs> 
He wrote one novella called The Heroic Slave in 1852, although um, that's the only time he formally tried fiction. Uh, some have said that his autobiographies have a lot of good fiction in them, which frankly, most great autobiographies do, but it's not quite fiction, of course. Um, he also tried his hand at verse poetry, but it wasn't his best mode. His mode was prose poetry. Now, democracy, this wonderful word, this great idea, this mysterious force, that we all want to see, we all want to achieve, we all want to preserve, we think. Although there's much, much of the world, of course, that does not want to do that. Uh, sometimes people with power despise democracy. We just live through that in the United States. We're still living through that. Now, his, his commentaries of many, many kinds on the ideas of democracy, we're not always using the the word democracy, he had many other words for it. Uh, no one in American letters in the 19th century ever explained or captured the essence, the meaning of being enslaved, being owned from cradle to grave and beyond, of having your body owned and potentially your mind owned quite like Douglas did. But sometimes his commentaries on democracy were truly about uh, the polity, the political world. Uh, he could sound at times like a political theorist. For example, in a great speech he gave in 1869 and then other times called the Composite Nation, which was this dream, this vision of the multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial America, he gave a definition of a nation Note this definition. He said, a nation, quote, implied a willing surrender and subjection of individual aims and ends, often narrow and selfish, to the broader and better ones that arise out of society as a whole. It is both, he said, a sign and a result of civilization. What's a democracy? Well, it's a political system where we all have to give up something that we hold individually very close, maybe even sacred, in order to acknowledge those ideas of others so that some kind of whole can function. It's the ancient conception of democracy, and it's why it is so hard. But like Walt Whitman, Douglas could also uh, use all kinds of metaphors from nature, from the beauty of nature, from the power of nature, to capture what democracy might mean. Two little examples. Um, Douglas, in Douglas's autobiographies, as some of you will know if you've ever read them, his first, the narrative, the short one, his, his second, My Bondage and My Freedom of 1855, which is his long form masterpiece uh, and a much more mature kind of powerful writing, Douglas would often use the animal world, the world of nature to fashion metaphors about just what freedom would mean or what this democracy thing might be. For example, he writes in that early autobiography of remembering being on the Y House plantation as a child. He's only six and seven years old, but he remembers walking out in the morning and seeing huge flocks of blackbirds squawking and making a great ruckus of sound and then watching them fly and wishing he was on their wings. Their wings were his images of freedom. He said, quote, I used to contrast my condition with the blackbirds in whose wild and sweet songs I fancied them so happy. Their apparent joy only deepened the shades of my sorrow. Well, what is democracy? Well, it's probably going to be a system that actually allows that dreamer looking at the birds 
to actualize in life itself being on those wings. Then there's Douglas's famous metaphor of the sailing ships on the Chesapeake. It's the most beautiful metaphor in his writings. It's a very long one. He develops it over two pages in the original narrative, uses it again in the second autobiography. It's when he's a 17 year old uh, teenager trapped under the whip of a overseer he's been hired out to named Edward Covey, who beat the Dickens out of Douglas uh, frequently, but on Sundays gave him days off. And Douglas tells us he would go out and sit on an knoll, uh, arise and look out at the Chesapeake Bay. And in his narrative, he stops at one point and remembers what the bay looked like. He puts his voice as a teenager in quotation marks. And he talks about the white sailing ships on the Chesapeake. He talks about their gallant decks. Oh, that I were on one of your gallant decks as you fly around the world, free, free, free. But here I am bound in irons. He plays that metaphor of the ships on the sea being, he calls them freedom's swift-winged angels. Now, I have been to all of these places on the Eastern shore, and I have to tell you of some startling realizations I had. I got to stay at the White House Plantation on two occasions. I got to stay in the old kitchen house where little Fred Bailey actually lived as a child, which has now been totally remodeled into a lovely two bedroom apartment. And I went out one morning on a glorious spring day with no one else around on that gorgeous landscape. And there they were, a huge flock of blackbirds in the trees making a ruckus of a noise. And I realized Douglas didn't make that up. There's a metaphor he remembered and converted into art. Same with the Chesapeake. I was given a tour there once, and my tour guide said, would you like to see the Covey farm? Sure, we got there. We walked out into fields, we walked up a ridge, and there it was on a July day in what must have been about 1980, <laughs> sailing ships all over the Chesapeake. And I realized, my God, he didn't make that up either. He remembered it and converted it into art. Well, all right, uh, metaphors for democracy, we might have called this talk. Uh, and I'd like to just give a few other examples in the time I have about how Douglas could convert his experience as a slave and then his experience after slavery as the great orator, the editor, uh, you know, the spokesman of black America by the time of the Civil War, and then much later in the last third of his life, and he doesn't die until 1895, how he still was a master of metaphors of the conditions of race in America, the conditions of the post-slavery period, the conditions of that era of reconstruction, and that era of of intense racial violence in the South. But what Douglas believed in, along with his deep, deep and abiding sense of history that he had gained from the Bible and from reading especially the Old Testament, Douglas was a prophet or a product first of his biblical grounding, and eventually a kind of a prophet who could find words, as Abraham Heschel, the great Jewish theologian said, who could find words to explain history, to explain situations that the rest of us just can't quite find. And what Douglas became, apart from that biblical grounding he had, and there's no major Douglas speech without numerous references to the Hebrew prophets, but his other grounding was in the Enlightenment. 
in the natural rights tradition, in the belief, this deep and abiding belief, especially forged in the 18th century, but, it, but as old as biblical times, that all human beings are born with certain inherent liberties that no system can deny. Now, when he's remembering his childhood in all these autobiographies, he often would refer to gaining understanding of human nature, gaining understanding of the nature of people, gaining understanding of the nature of slaveholders and their minds. And from that, he says, he began to realize what natural rights were. Because this right to, to have something, to own something, to, to control one's own liberty, to actually learn to read and write, to actually be able to go to school, since, since he began to learn that that was so precious to white people and so precious to the master class, he began to realize maybe that's just natural. But some people make sure that other people don't get it. And he began to call slavery, therefore, a form of tyranny and a form of piracy. Piracy in the sense that it was stealing the natural liberties of other people. Um, there are many other examples. Uh, he first encountered uh, uh, St. Paul or the Epistle Paul and probably the Exodus story when he was in Baltimore. Uh, in, uh, you know, the 1830s. He doesn't escape until 1838. He attended four different churches. He came under the wing of an old black preacher named Charles Lawson. And in this setting, he began to learn passages from the Bible, like the one in Paul, where he says, the law, quote, is written on our hearts. The law, natural law natural rights, the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue unencumbered one's living, written on our hearts. Douglas loved that passage, and he became a lifetime uh, devotee in a way, kind of a fanboy of Paul, the apostle, and there's a lot can be said about that. Um, he also gained his natural rights uh, ideas from fighting against the slave power when he's, when he's an abolitionist, fighting against slaveholding mentalities, fighting against the pro-slavery arguments, um, and especially against such pro-slavery arguments as Black people are born different. Black, black people are born naturally inferior, naturally not inclined to intellect, naturally more inclined to labor. Douglas began to think and think and think that through, and he, and he began to read a lot about it too. Let's not forget that. This man collected books from the earliest time he had a few dollars to spend on them. And he began to, he began to realize that tyranny is a human creation against natural law against God's law, the law written on our hearts. Uh, sometimes he would even use metaphors of physics. He would say, you know, as in physics, physics tells us that gravity will make everything fall to the ground. And he says, physics should also tell us that born into us are these liberties, born into us. He sometimes would employ metaphors of precious ore. He would say natural rights are like the precious ore in the ground. They're like iron ore or oil from the ground or coal. It merely had to be found and harnessed. Um, well, I could go on and on. There's so many examples of Douglas's embrace of the natural rights tradition. And out of that flowed over time in his rhetoric, whether it was oratorical or whether it was uh, 
in written form many, many, many examples of his embrace of what we are now calling more readily democracy. We don't talk as easily today about natural rights. That was an 18th century set of ideas that flowed into the 19th century and got replaced, especially by this notion of equality that came out of, in the United States anyway, came out of the emancipation of the slaves and then out of the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments to our Constitution, especially the 14th Amendment, which enshrined into our law, human law, equality before law. Now, all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could speak all day on Douglas and natural rights. I don't want to do that. What I do want to do is just conclude because I think I'm going up to my time limit. I want to conclude with just a couple of examples of how Douglas could employ these ideas um, in season and out, whatever the subject, early in his career, late in his career, in the middle of his career. He had that way of a prophet, of capturing in words what's happening to us what was happening to this democracy in America as it was torn to shreds in the Civil War and had to then be recreated. Uh, you could start with Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass's famous Fourth of July speech. It's his greatest work of rhetoric. It is the rhetorical masterpiece of American abolitionism. It is the speech in which he blisters American hypocrisy about being a republic that owns slaves, but it is much, much more than that. It takes you inside of this idea of what it would actually be to create a true democracy and how hard that is. Or you could go to that composite nation speech I mentioned earlier, which is, uh, it reads today like a multiculturalism manifesto of the 1990s or the early aughts of the 21st century. It was Douglas, uh, the most sanguine and hopeful he'd ever been in the late 1860s, just after the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments, Reconstruction was at its peak and the 15th Amendment, which was voting rights, was just about to be passed. And Douglas fashioned this speech called the Composite Nation in which he imagined, he said, look, we have an opportunity here because of emancipation, the aftermath of the Civil War, to do something no nation, no people has ever done. And that is create a nation of all the peoples of planet Earth, all colors, all religions, all ethnicities, all races, coming together and all living under a single constitution guided by the equality of law, the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. He said, imagine the opportunity they faced. Now, of course, that's going to pretty much fail during Reconstruction. It's going to be defeated by the counter-revolution of the, the White South and the Democratic Party then in the South, and by terror and violence. And it got Douglas eventually saying things like, well, I mean, he was a profound believer in, for example, the right to vote. It was his, his most important right. Uh, but he did end up having to say against, in the face of such violence of the Ku Klux Klan and others, that you cannot fight bears, he said, with ethics. <laughs> you have to fight them with guns or something else. But one last example from one of his other great speeches, and it's the last great speech of his life. Uh, as many of you will know, because you know some American history, Douglas lives till 1895. He has that extraordinary experience, and it's a major theme of my biography, of having been born <laughs> out there on the Eastern shore in a kind of a pre-modern moment. I mean, he's born before steamboats are on the rivers. He's born well before the telegraph, well before the railroads are carving their way across America and changing everything from clocks and time to transportation. 
Uh, he's born before the Rotary Press, which made daily newspapers and weekly newspapers possible. And, he, and he's born before they had these steamships that could cross the Atlantic in seven or eight days, which was considered a miracle. But he's gonna live all the way to 1895 in, a, in another moment of true modernity when the, they have the first light bulbs, they have the first telephones, uh, they have uh, even the phonograph. Although this greatest order of the 19th century so far as we know was never recorded. That's a long story. But in between, look what he lived through. He lived through the entire crisis over slavery in America. He lived through the coming of the Civil War, the fighting of America's Armageddon, the destruction of the first American Republic and the creation of the second in the new constitution that came out of that war. And he came to consider himself as a kind of founder, though he was never elected to anything of the second American Republic. And yet he's gonna live long enough, another 30 years, to see that victory, all those triumphs, basically all but betrayed. Well, they were betrayed and all but completely defeated by the Jim Crow system, uh, by the beginnings of segregation, uh, by violence, uh, and then finally by lynching. The last great speech of his life, and I'll end on this, uh, was called Lessons of the Hour. It was, a, it was an, an analytical speech he first crafted in 1893 as a mean, and then he gave it countless times over the course of the next year and a half. And this is an old man by then, he's 75, 76, he's not well, he's got angina, he's got heart disease, his hands are trembling but he gave it all over the country. And in Lessons of the Hour, he gave a three-part analysis of why lynching was happening in this country. But one of his arguments was that it was rooted in a big lie. We're hearing so much now in America about a big lie. The big lie now is Donald Trump's claim and all of his minions claiming that he really won the election of 2020 and Joe Biden didn't. That big lie is animating our politics. That big lie practically owns one of America's political parties. In Douglas's case, he said, you know, lynching is rooted in a big lie and that's the sexual abuse or rape by black men of white women. And he said, the problem is this, quote, a lie is worth nothing when it has lost its ability to deceive. And if it is at all in my power, this lie shall lose its power to deceive. In other words, he was saying, if any kind of democracy is actually to work, you not only have to have elections that people trust, but you have to take the power out of a lie. When that lie becomes huge and so political and so powerful. Last point. When Douglas was looking for a way to end his second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, uh, his long form masterpiece, this is in 1855, so it's still six years before the Civil War, he ended with this sentence. He said, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. Now, what is a democracy but a place where the voice, the pen, and the vote are truly free? Uh, thank you. And I really look forward to my chat with Klaus and to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, David. Thank you so much uh, for these enlightening remarks that already let us glimpse uh, a bit of the scope uh, and the challenges of writing uh, a biography about this extraordinary 19th century American. Um, you know, we already have a couple of questions in the chat, but I'm, I've been asked to, you know, 
engage in a conversation with you uh, also about the enterprise itself, the enterprise of of writing, you know, the autobi the, the the biography of of this of this you know particular and extraordinary American. Now, I'd imagine as a historian and uh, as someone who had already spent a considerable amount of time uh, reading and writing about Douglas, uh, the task of bringing to life for your readers, but also uh, as a first step. Uh, for yourself, the biographer. And I mean, beyond what we already know about Douglas, mostly from what he has written about himself, uh, this wasn't an easy task at all. Uh, talk about what eventually did it for you. And, and if there was ever a pivotal moment when you said, this is it, this could take away the veil and reveal the man, the human being behind the historical persona. Well, thanks, Klaus. Uh, you know, I don't know if there was a single moment, but there's a big one. And in fact, it is essentially the idea, and it is the reason I wrote this book. And in br very brief terms, it is because you're right. I had worked on Douglas early. My first book was on Douglas out of graduate school. In fact, I had just published that book, I think, what, a couple of years before I came to Munich. So I was still giving talks on Douglas, you know, then. Uh, and then I'd edited editions of his autobiographies, et cetera, et cetera. But I had Douglas out of my life until about 15 years ago now. Uh, I encountered a private collection, uh, extraordinary collection of Douglas manuscripts uh, and scrapbooks and letters in Savannah, Georgia, owned by a wonderful man named Walter Evans. Uh, I think, Klaus, you've probably heard this story, but most haven't. Uh, Walter is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, but came north for much of his education. Uh, he went to Howard University for his bachelor's degree in the University of Michigan Medical School. And then he practiced as a surgeon for 30 some years in Detroit, in Michigan, which is where I'm from. And a long story short, I went to Savannah uh, somewhere in 2006 or thereabout to give a talk to teachers about Douglas's narrative, his autobiography, because they were teaching it. And that's the day I met Walter. We had lunch. He took me to his house. He got out portions of his Douglas collection on his dining room table. And I was stunned. I did not decide, this was not a moment, I did not decide on that spot, oh, now I'll do a new life of Douglas because that took me months to get up the courage. Uh, it's a big life, it's a complicated life, but that collection opens up the last third of Douglas's life, the older man, his huge extended family, his many relationships, his many rivalries, mm -hmm. his engagements in politics mm -hmm. and his kind of, sort of insider status in Washington, D.C. in those years, it opened up that part of his life as never before because the core of that collection are nine very large Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept by Douglas's adult sons. So it was encountering this gold mine of sources and research materials that led me to commit to writing A New Life of Douglas and anyone who looks at the book will notice in the footnotes that the Walter Evans collection is all over the footnotes, especially for the last half, last third of the book. So it was encountering new sources that really got me to, to make that decision to do it. And then along the way, writing the book, there were all sorts of moments of realizing, oh my God, I think I know enough now to say that, or I think I understand this enough to say that. Uh, but there were still, of course, enigmas, as there are in any biography. No matter how many sources somebody left you, there are always enigmas about every human being that you can't quite solve. Uh, thank you, David. This, this actually already uh, you know, answers my the second question that I, that I had for you. Uh, and, and this is, you know, in terms of your approach to writing biography, uh, and uh, you have to keep in mind that you know, this is a biography about an extremely uh, literary figure. It's a, almost, it's a writer, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. 
would you place profit or freedom more with books such as, say, David Reynolds' biography of Walt Whitman or Andrew yeah. Del Banco's uh, of, of Melville? Yeah. Uh, both of which claim in, in their subtitles, uh, you know, to also narrate the story of American society during the second half of the 19th century. Or to the contrary, was it more the person, the extraordinary human being uh, that you wanted to shed light on and to excavate from the myth and legends, uh, many self-promoted that already surrounded Douglas? Oh, terrific question, Klaus. Uh asked by a, a writer. <laughs> uh, you know, I love that question because I did have models. I have models in biography. Uh, actually, Andy Del Banco's Melville is one of them because that is, that is one way of trying to understand because Melville actually didn't leave that many letters. It's, it's the biography of a writer. Um, David Reynolds' is Whitman too uh, is a model, but also I, I modeled Alan Rampersad's biography a little bit of uh, Ralph Ellison. Oh. Uh, and then I, there are others as well. Uh, the answer though is I wanted to do both. And I did do both to whatever success my readers can say. I wanted this to be, and it is, I made words, it's right in my preface. I made words, the central thread of this book. It was Douglas's mastery of language that I made the central thread. And that makes his autobiographies both your source and a subject, because you have to keep trying to explain why does this man keep writing his own story? And how, what is he hiding from us? Which is a lot. Uh, and yes, he crafted his own mythology. He did indeed. But I wanted this to be a book where, you know, not all biography does this, but most biographers do now. I wanted to have a balance, some kind of balance between the public and the private. You know, the public man, the mm -hmm. activist, leader, spokesman, and writer, but then the private human being, the man with a huge extended family, two marriages, relationships, incredibly bitter rivalries with people and, and, and difficult relationships with his children and on and on and on. And I made one vow with myself that I may or may not have fully achieved, but I tried in every chapter to keep the public and the private alive in every chapter. In other words, there are no chapters that are just about the marriages or just about his relationship with his three sons and, and his one daughter. There's no chapter that's just about the politics of the Civil War. There's no chapter that's only about reconstruction policy. In every chapter, I'm trying to weave the public and private together because it's, it's you know, it's, it's my simple view that that's the way we live. Mm -hmm. You know, no, nobody gets up any given day and says, okay, today I'll only be my public self or today I'll only be my private self. Now, sometimes maybe we manage that on a holiday or something, but we live both of those, uh, whoever the figure at the same time. So I, I, I also had another little, and this sounds strange, but it's a historian's instinct. I wasn't gonna play any games with this, which some biographers do. I told the story in its chronological order as he lived it. But with Douglas, of course, the man of so much autobiographical writing, you've got a lot of his reflections back on each period of his life. And you have to constantly make decisions of how am I going to use that? Am I going to use that? Is that just trickery or is that real evidence? What does he reveal in that part of the autobiography and what does he hide? Um, so uh, I love the craft of biography, but it is damned hard and that's probably why I like it. <laughs> well, thanks David. This actually leads to my next question, which sure. would be about the three autobiographies that you, that you mentioned and yeah. uh, you know, all by now classics of the genre uh, that Douglas had written to promote his own version of who he is. Right. Uh, you know, his thoughts, dreams, hopes, and you know, his at times desperation. Uh, to what extent was the extensive self-writing of the man rather an obstacle than an asset to revealing the true uh, Douglas, i.e. the Douglas as he emerged from your sources and historical research. So, make I love that question too. I, 
boy, I love being interviewed by a literary scholar, a literary historian like you are. Uh, actually, the truth is for his early life, for his slave life, the first 20 years, yeah. the autobiographies are very, not only useful, they are actually quite revealing. Uh, he has to carve into his memory, you know, to write about those, 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 those stages of his youth, his child. This is a man, he's only 27 when he writes that first autobiography, and he's only 37 when he writes the second one. So this is somebody trying to recollect his childhood. And there's a great deal about it that reveals a lot about him. Um, partly because I think it's much easier to write about the terrors and the, you know, the horrible world of being a slave than it was later writing about his successes. You know, success gets a little boring compared to writing about your slave life. It's the latter part of his life from the 1840s and 50s on where the autobiographies get in your way. I've often likened his autobiographies as both a source and a subject, but they are kind of, they're like a screen. They're like a wall you're trying to see through and around because in the autobiographies, especially when he begins to reflect on his later life and when he writes the third one, it's so self-protective. It's so self-serving. It's the hero ascending, you know, from the hell of slavery to the uh, joy or heaven of freedom. But it's also by the third one, a lot of name dropping about what a famous man he was and all the famous people he knew and all the great events he witnessed. Now, that third autobiography, Life and Times, which was not a commercial success like the first two were, they really were. His first two autobiographies were 19th century bestsellers. But the third one is extremely valuable just for some information. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's less good as literature. Let's put it that way. It's less effective as autobiographical art. It's good for information. It's, it, we learn a lot about John Brown from that. We learn a lot about his, his three meetings with Lincoln. I mean, basically, Douglas is is our only prime, well, our main primary source. <laughs> and he gives it to us. Uh, there are many other aspects uh, of that third autobiography that tell us a lot about where he is, what he's doing, who he's doing it with. Um, but that craft of auto, this was a very wily autobiographer who protected that which he did not want the world to know. And you have to get at that by other means, by letters, by other kinds of sources, by other people's letters. And sometimes you never quite get there at all. For, you know, there are many examples, but one example is his relationship with his wife, Anna. His first wife, Anna, who followed him out of Baltimore. She was born free, but she lived this prescribed life of a black woman in Baltimore. She follows him out of Baltimore in 1838. They were married for 44 years. She was the mother of all five of their children. The last one, Annie, died at only age 11. Anna remained non-literate all of her life. The most famous African-American man of letters in the world was married to a woman who did not read. And it became a difficult marriage, although an extremely close bond of a marriage as well. But in 1,200 pages of autobiography, there is only one mention of Anna, and she is called my wife. Mm. That's it. He doesn't say anything about her. He says very precious little about his children as well. He is hiding that. There are ways to get to the children because they left a lot of letters, but not many ways to get to Anna, although I did manage some ways. Uh, but there's a lot of his private standing that he just wasn't going to tell the world about. And that's true of, especially in the 19th century, nobody wrote tell-all autobiographies back then. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that all that he never told and did not want to. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, we have already uh, a, a slew of very interesting questions in the chat that I'm going to 
uh, read for you uh, in a minute, but maybe just one more uh, on sure. my part. Uh, David, I take it uh, that Douglas uh, has incarnated uh, the, the best, uh, but also some of the negative of the American character, you know, from what you told us and from what I read in, in Prophet of Freedom. Uh, you know, a radical and a rebel when it comes to freeing the slave or his democratic conviction and ideals, uh, as you write at times, wavering even uh, to even advocate violence on behalf of abolition. Mm -hmm. Yet also a man who later in his life had become almost a model American, a living proof to the American myth of the self-made man. The right. American who transcended outside limitations to reinvent himself numerous times to finally become an esteemed and highly acclaimed public figure. Talk about the metamorphosis from Douglas, the escaped slave, to Douglas, the model citizen and acclaimed writer and politician, a man who today, as you also mentioned in the book, is frequently claimed by conservative Republicans as one yeah. of their own. You know? Yeah, they won't give up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this question. One of the I have basically six central themes in the book, and another one of them, other than words and autobiography, is the story of the radical outsider, you know, the radical abolitionist who, as you suggested, even begins to embrace possible uses of violence in the 1850s, engages in fugitive slave rescues himself, and so on and so on. Um, the radical outsider who was never inside of power, always on the outside, knocking on the doors, the great critic, you know, the Jeremiah, always on the outside. But through the course of the Civil War, emancipation, the remaking of the United States, he becomes, with time, a kind of political insider. He learns a certain level of political pragmatism that he had to learn but he practices it sometimes with mixed results. But he becomes by the 1870s and certainly by the 1880s when he gets three appointments from the federal government uh, in Washington, a, a kind of insider within, within Republican party circles, mm -hmm. an advisor to several presidents on some levels. And he, according to his critics, um, kind of fell out of touch with the plight of the freed people, with the plight of, uh, of Southern blacks. Um, now, that's a fascinating story, you know, because we've seen it, we've seen it happen again and again and again in American history. Think of, think of so many of the great leaders of the civil rights movement who, you know, yesterday were on the outside knocking on the doors and leading marches and leading the rebellion, so to speak. And then got elected to Congress, got elected mayor, got elected, uh, you know, to all sorts of offices. And one of them, uh, the next generation, uh, named Barack Obama, even got elected president of the United States. So political outsider to, I mean, radical outsider to political insider. It's, it's a remarkable story. And of course, it means he's making some compromises of different kinds. It means he gets into lots of rivalries and battles with the next generation of black leadership. It also taught me, the more I looked at Douglas, a great deal about his personality. This was somebody who loved being on the pedestal. He didn't want to get knocked off. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if, if he got attacked, he often threw it back muddier than it was thrown at him. Uh, it wasn't pretty at times. He also was highly sensitive to any kind of slights, whether those were racial slights or slights about his lack of education, mm -hmm. lack of formal education. Um, so um, yeah, I, I love this part about him because there, there's so many contradictions and conflicts. And at the end of the day, Douglas, like many people, if you think about it, who had so little formal education in his life, had to make people and books mm -hmm. and experience the source of his education, which means you can't fit him into boxes. He changes. He's not static. You know, he starts out as an abolitionist, as a Garrisonian, believing, you know, you shouldn't involve yourself in political parties. The Constitution was 
was a covenant with death and on and on and on. And, and, he, and, a, and he was supposed to be a pacifist, which he really wasn't. And on and on and on. He changes all of those views. He changes strategies. He changes his ideology at times except for those fundamentals of believing in a kind of a biblical theory of history and then in the natural rights tradition, he did have a base, but you can't keep him in certain kinds of strategic or ideological boxes. He's always kind of in transit. Mm -hmm. And I actually love this about studying Douglas. He can be confounding, but he kind of was a sponge. If he met you, he tried to figure out what he can learn from you. And he would. <laughs> but when he might have learned whatever he thought he could learn from you, he might then just discard you. Mm -hmm. And he didn't keep friendships that well. <laughs> so, you know, he's a mercurial yeah. character and uh, much more turbulent, I think, uh, in a psychological way than the autobiographies are fashioned for us to believe. And it does come through, especially in private letters. And indeed, a lot of the private letters with his own adult children is where he often opens up. Um, David, uh, what you just said, this prompted a, a, a very quick follow-up question. Uh, sure. You write that, uh, you know, Douglas was not only one of the best known Americans of his times, internationally, yes. but uh, also the most photographed American uh, of his Oh, time. yes. So Let's bring up Jasmine with the photographs. Excuse me. <laughs> Let's to have Jasmine pop up a few of those photographs just to show a couple images if we could. Maybe we can put them on, on the website. Well, okay. Or we can. Oh, oh right now. Yeah, that's even There we better. go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the most photographed American, uh, David, how important was public recognition and fame for Douglas? And how did he deal mm -hmm. with the attention he received? Uh, later in his life, and, and particularly with situations where he felt like, you know, this attention is maybe going away or waning or not as strong, you know, as it used to be. Yes, uh, you know, that's great. And I, I, I'm sorry I didn't get the pictures up earlier, but this is the perfect moment. He mm -hmm. probably was the most photographed American of the 19th century. It, it's the claim of of some of a book, recent book came out called Picture Picturing Frederick Douglass, which is a brilliant collection of all extant images of Douglass. Something like 164 odd photographs now survive of Frederick Douglass. There are probably more out there that will be found. This is an image of him in about 1857. It was found in a Kansas City museum where they had never displayed it. Uh, if Jasmine could just uh, maybe scroll to the next one or two. Uh, he was first photographed in the early 1840s uh, when he's very young. This was uh, later in the 1840s. Um, and then he traveled ubiquitously. In fact, I argue in the book that he may have been the most traveled American of the 19th, that is in sheer distances and miles the most traveled American of the 19th century, with the possible exception of Mark Twain, because Twain toured all over Asia. Douglas went all over Europe, but not Asia. But I also believe, I mean, no one, no one will ever know, but there may have been more Americans or more people heard Douglas speak than any other person in the 19th century. That's how uh, constant his travel was and his speaking tours. And with that came a serious problem with what you named, Klaus, as fame and the perils of fame. Today, we call it celebrity. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that word then. The word was fame. And it had two sides. Uh, he couldn't go anywhere without being recognized, especially after he was on the cover of Harper's Weekly, which was during Reconstruction. He, he was on the cover. It was the equivalent of today being on the cover of Der Spiegel or the cover of Time, Time Magazine, Magazine. Or, or on the front of the Google logo or something, you know, uh, which actually he has been now on the Google logo once in some artist image. Uh, so he, and, and it, yeah, he, he, let's get him a little older here. I mean, look at this man. He was stunning and he knew it. And he would frankly manipulate photographers. Uh, John Stauffer and others who did this photography book brilliantly showed 
how Douglas managed some of these photographers. He had favorite photographers. There were some photographers that, that took his image some six, eight, 10 and 11 times because he would go back to them. But also wherever he traveled, the local photographer would want him to come sit. And if Jasmine could go to the next two. Yeah, well, this is one from later in life. Uh, it's the late eight. Well, okay, let's go to that one. Uh, this, I love this photograph because it was taken in 1863 January in Hillsdale, Michigan. There's a little town in Southern Michigan that has a little college. Douglas at that point is on a tour right after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, giving a, a, an exciting new speech called the Proclamation and the Negro Army. And it's in this speech that he begins to develop his arguments for recruiting black soldiers and so on. But look, he's in a studio sitting in a, a staged photograph, uh, always, always well-dressed. I mean, sometimes a little better than others, uh, depending on how long he'd been on the road. But wherever he would go, even in small towns like this, there'd be a local photographer who would say, would you come sit for me? And these photographs just started to appear. Now, uh, we know more about the photographs now than people did then, but he was one of the most recognizable of Americans, especially eventually when the hair went white and he would always wear this big top hat and he was almost six foot two to begin with, which was tall in the 19th century. So wherever Douglas went, he was kind of the center of the crowd. And I have many, many descriptions. A lot of these came out of the oven scrapbooks, by the way, which were full of thousands of newspaper clippings collected by the family because they hired a clipping service. But in these clippings, you get all kinds of responses, people describing what Douglas looked like, the first time they heard his voice, the first time they heard him speak, you know, um, and so on and so on. And many, many examples in the press clippings of how he would lose his voice uh, at times and have to take a day off or even a week off at times. Um, but the visual image was something he now actually used to say what, look what he's saying. He's saying, you may out there think black people are uneducated. You may think black people are in some form naturally inferior and all of that, but look at me. I'm not only well-dressed, I'm educated. I'm brilliant. Come hear me. Mm -hmm. And more and more and more, he used this new technology of photography to argue, if you like, for a kind of human equality. Um, fame can be, though, a perilous thing. And I have some examples in the book of him encountering the problem of fame and, uh, <laughs> and not liking it at all. Thanks, David. I, I think uh, it's time, you know, to open up our discussion and let the audience also weigh in. And I, I would like to start with the first question. I will be reading these questions chronologically. Uh, here's the first one. There was a very unfortunate debate about the 15th Amendment and who should get voting rights then. Susan B. Anthony, among others, and with racial undertones, demanded that it be given, quote, first to women. Uh, to the most intelligent and capable portion of the women at least, unquote. While in 1869, Frederick Douglass, who was a supporter of voting rights for women, argued, quote, I must say that I do not see how anyone can pretend that there is the same urgency in giving the ballot to women as to the Negro, unquote. Women had to wait until 1920 to finally get the right to vote on the federal level. How do you look at the debate today? Uh, was this a mischance uh, to achieve more, especially for women, both white and African-American? Well, I love the question. Uh, it, was a, it was a big crisis in 1869, 70, when the 15th Amendment passed. Uh, was it a mischance? Oh yes, it was a mischance, but it was essentially politically an impossible chance. And that's what happened. Douglas was early on, as this particular person who asked this question must know, was early in his life a 
a full supporter of women's rights, women's right to vote in particular, but he was also a supporter in the 1840s of women's economic rights and in, in 1850s. That is rights, right to own property, right to their property after divorce, which, which was a huge problem in the 19th century. Most states never allowed women even the right, if they married, to, to own anything. Well, mm -hmm. And, and he, even, he even put on the masthead of his newspaper after the Seneca Falls Convention, the Women's Rights Convention of 1848, which he attended. He was the only black abolitionist there. He signed a Declaration of Sentiments. He went back and the masthead of his newspaper, the North Star read, right is of no color or sex. Right on the masthead. Well, after the Civil War, when the 15th Amendment is being debated, uh, women were left out. Everyone knows that. And at the time, everyone knew if you put if you put women's right to vote in that 15th Amendment, it never passes. All the members of the Congress, of course, are men. It has to get two thirds of the legislatures to, to pass a constitutional amendment. They're all men. Uh, and it was done to give the right to vote to black men, especially in the South. It was a very strategic way it was written. Well, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony, and others of the great leaders of the women's suffrage movement uh, had run out of patience and went kind of ballistic and attacked um, people like Douglas and sometimes with uh, brutally racist language. Let's just be honest, even using the N word. And they had a terrible breakup. <laughs> They'd been allies for years, uh, which they never quite reconciled. Douglas's relationships with Stanton and Anthony never fully reconciled, although Douglas and Susan Anthony sat right next to each other on the same platform on the last day of Douglas's life at a women's rights convention in Washington, D.C. He didn't speak at that convention. He, they just wanted him there to you know, be Douglas. And he went home later that afternoon had a massive heart attack and died. And Susan Anthony went to pieces, by the way, out of grief. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was a mischance in 1869 to get women into the Constitution. But black men wouldn't have been there either. And it's one of those moments in history where uh, to advance somebody's rights, you had to deny them to someone else. It's a misfortune to say the least. And it led to a bitter, bitter breakup between a lot of former allies. Okay, uh, here's uh, another question. Thank you, David, for this extraordinary journey through Douglas and your telling of his tale. Your quip, quote, we might have called this talk metaphors of democracy, unquote, was striking. Indeed, those poetical tropes most real read most authentically. Toward that end, I wonder whether you might speak, if you find it relevant, of your own journey from a mobile home in Flint, Michigan to Yale. Against uh, the touchstones uh, of your own autobiography and writing, Douglas's autobiography and writing, and perhaps even the book-long epic simile that Harper Lee made of race and poverty, is education, as we call it, the means to the Douglas Whitman-esque composite nation? And if so, what has kept it thus far from realization? <laughs> That's a complex question. Woo! That's a big maybe, one. I don't know who this is. With your own history. <laughs> I don't know who this is out there who knows I grew up in a trailer park. I, I don't tell everybody that. I don't tell hardly anyone that, but- Not even I knew that. Is that really true? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I grew up in the deep working class of Flint, Michigan, uh, the, the second city of the American auto industry where, where General Motors was born. And my brother and I were lucky to grow up in that post-World War II generation where the working class could, could get their kids into college. So to, to the core of the question, yes, education <laughs> is the ultimate democratizer. Mm. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it sounds, it sounds trite to say it, but is it ever true? Literacy first in parts of the world, 
then I suppose, you know, some kind of land ownership, but then it's education that has liberated millions and millions of people. And in the United States, that was surely the case with public universities, uh, public schools. I was raised in public schools with very good teachers. And then in public universities, I went to Big Ten universities for all of my education. And then I end up teaching at fancy places like Amherst and Yale. Um, I nothing against that. I love it here, <laughs> but um, the the access to a public school education and a public university has everything to do with how I ever got an education to begin with, and somehow it came out of the values my parents had because they didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad was an auto worker and my mother was a secretary and, and that's great, but they had the, they had a value that their sons were going to go to college. Um, then, you know, it was up to us to make something of it. Uh, but look, the democratizing, this is part of the dilemma we have in America. Now we have, we have institutions that aren't functioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, political institutions like the U S Senate, which has never been a democratic institution. And most Americans don't even understand why. The U.S. Senate is not a democratic body. <laughs> but it's the public school in this country. So 85% of Americans who go to any kind of college or higher education go to a public university. But even those public universities have become very expensive. And uh, they're nothing like the cost they were when I went. Um, and if we don't save our great experiment in public education, and we won't have much of a democracy left. You have solved that in Europe, and I know you haven't solved everything, <laughs> but making education cheap, if not relatively free, was one of the greatest achievements of social democracy. Uh, in America, the best education is in the most expensive schools. That's just the way it is. And it, it puts out of whack this this quest we have for democracy. Instead, we keep recycling that the haves have and the too often the have nots do not have. Uh, I don't claim to be any model of anything uh, or paragon of anything. I'm a product of the post-World War II boom of industrial cities in the Midwest and great public universities that made possible the mobility from the working class to a middle class in a modern democracy. Um, much of that is in peril now for lots of reasons people, you know, we could all debate. Couldn't agree more, David. Uh, next question, how and when did you become interested in Frederick Douglass? Well, it was not in high school because no one taught me anything in high school. I had two great high school teachers, but they didn't, they didn't teach about black history then. This is, <laughs> you know, I'm afraid this was the 1960s. But it was in college, uh, I took what I think was the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State in either 1968 or 69. It was taught by a man named Les Rout, who was African-American, but his field was Brazil and Latin America. I suspect they just asked Les to teach the course because he was black. And it was great, it was my first real encounters with you know, a survey history course of the black experience. And we may have read some portion of Douglas in that course, although I really don't remember, but it was when I was a high school teacher in the 1970s for seven years in Flint, Michigan, where I grew up, that we were creating black history courses for the first time. It's then that I first read Douglas in some small way. I had a poster of him on my classroom wall, which I still have here in my apartment in New Haven, and the reason I've kept that poster is it's, it's a keepsake because it, it gives him a middle name he never had and it has his wrong birth date. That's a collector's item, man. So I've kept it forever. Uh, and again, it's one of his photographs. But then in, in graduate school, I wanted to work on abolitionism. I wanted to work on the coming of the Civil War. And I, at one point, just said, I don't want to work on black abolitionists. This is the late 70s, early 80s. And that's how I landed on Douglas. But it, 
you know, it came out of that ferment of the 60s and the 70s and the explosion of interest in slavery and the black experience. This, these were the questions I was asking. It's, it's the subject I wanted to know about and uh, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> um, we have three more questions in the chat. And I think, you know, after those, we should, you know, eventually wrap up uh, this sure. uh, session tonight. Uh, next question, I'm, I'm curious about the metaphors of the blackbirds and the ships. Are these not more representative of the freedom impulse than of democracy as you so admirably defined it? So the freedom impulse versus uh, democracy. Well, there's no question the, the, yeah, wishing you were on the wings of a bird in the sky or the, you know, the metaphorical swift winged angels of the white sailing ships is a freedom urge. There's no question, but if one achieves some of that freedom, then you have to live in society. And Douglas is going to learn that. There's, there's no question. Those metaphors come out of the remembrance of an autobiographer capturing his despair as a slave when he sees images of freedom. Maybe I'm converting them too much into images of democracy, but I do think that's what we do. Uh, you know, democracy is supposed to be a structure right? A constitution, this was James Madison's idea. You have, you have to have structures of law and constitutions to control human beings who are, you know, by their nature, gonna, gonna fight, gonna have conflict. So it's, it's how we take all this freedom and then put it into a, a structure and give up a little bit of our freedom so that everybody can have it. That's what he meant when, you know, much, much later in 1869, he gave that definition of, of a nation as a collection of people agreeing to sacrifice something in order to sustain the whole. Um, I don't know. I think one flows into another, but I take the point. Um, those blackbirds in the sky were, were themselves simply... Uh, you know, uh, a, a powerful vision of freedom, which later he has to figure out how do you achieve any kind of democracy in a society that holds 4 million people as slaves? Um, and that's where he began to be such a great analyst of hypocrisy, using irony, of contradiction, using irony. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in fact, Douglas learned his irony while he was still a slave because uh, everything was always not as it ought to be. <laughs> there was always a doubleness in his life, which is the essence of irony. Uh, the next question is actually a film question. And I, I have to admit, David, that I didn't mention in my introduction uh, to you uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the biography of Frederick Douglass had been optioned for a PBS series, I believe, and, and that you yourself, uh, you know, you have been involved in, in various film projects uh, over the years. And uh, so maybe you can comment as, you know, our uh, questioner asks uh, on the Netflix film project about Douglass' life that is being produced by the Obamas. So your comment on that. I don't know. This is a very informed audience all over Germany and Europe there. I don't know how they know all this. But anyway, uh, the answer is pretty quick. There is a documentary film all but finished. It's actually for HBO, not for PBS. That likely will be out in the fall. Mm. It's one hour or an hour and a half uh, on Douglas, mm -hmm. uh, produced by... Uh, a uh, company run by Dylan McGee, a very talented group. But the movie version with Netflix and the Obama's film company uh, is still in process. And all I can say about it is that it's in the hands of a screenwriter right now. I'm just waiting to hear uh, about the final version of a script and whether it gets approved. And anyone out there who's worked at all with the film industry knows that none of these things happen 
very quickly, nor sometimes by any logical lines. It's a crooked path to making a film and I don't hold my breath. I'm hopeful about it. Uh, I can simply say that the screenwriter whom I can't name uh, is working with a slice of Douglas's life. It will be a one, it'd be a feature, it's gonna be a feature film for Netflix, not a film series. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's working from the 1840s into the 1850s. It's gonna be that period of Douglas's life, mm -hmm. which is a very fruitful time to see Douglas undergoing tremendous changes. Um, but I don't know, I don't know. That could be years away or it could be one year away. I, I, I don't know yet. I'm usually the last one to find out. They optioned the book, but as I've learned, after that, you find out later what if they're gonna actually make a film. <laughs> okay, final question, David. Um, and a more specific question again. How were his writings uh, received in society? First part of the question, uh, you know, about the reception of what he has written, the many books that he put out and, and essays and so on. Yeah. What might have led to his declining uh, of the ticket with Woodhull as running mate? Ah, <laughs> well, those are two very different questions. The ticket with Woodhull, that, that, was a, the same person. that was an alleged presidential ticket with Victoria Woodhull as the presidential candidate and Douglas as the vice presidential candidate, a woman and a black man in, uh, was it 1872 or 76? Um, Douglas barely, barely publicly even acknowledged that he was on that ticket and he actually did no campaigning. So you have to be careful making too much of that. It was one of those political parties that got basically no votes and had almost no campaign. <laughs> and Douglas fully supported the Republican uh, Ulysses Grant that, that year. The reception of his writings, though, is an extraordinary story. Uh, his first narrative of 1845 was a bestseller by 19th century standards. It sold 30,000 copies in the first five years out. He couldn't even keep it in print on his tour of the British Isles in 45 to 47. Second autobiography, Bondage and Freedom, sold 18,000 copies in the first year. That's an extraordinary sale in the 19th century. That's not bad today, right, Klaus? Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Um, he had an audience and he knew how to cultivate it. The slave narratives had an audience. In fact, some scholars, even you perhaps, have argued that when Uncle Tom's Cabin came out in 1852 and took the world by storm and got translated all over the world, and got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of readers. Some have argued that it was the slave narratives that has sort of cultivated the audience for that. Not just Douglas, but some others as well. I think there's some truth to that. Uh, although Stowe's story, you know, captivated people in her own way. Um, his newspaper did not have a great number of subscribers. It was always very, very frustrating that he couldn't achieve a, a larger subscription rate. Uh, but the bulk of his subscribers were black and black communities didn't have much money mm -hmm. uh, to support the paper. The paper almost died year after year if it hadn't been for people helping him keep it alive. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest audience he ever had though were for the autobiographies, but also for the speeches. And some of his greatest speeches this man was a marketer. He would produce them in pamphlet form. I could name several of them. Uh, his famous speech called The Negro Ethnologically Considered, which was a scholarly lecture about uh, the hideous character of the racial sciences in the 1850s. He produced that in a pamphlet form. The Great Fourth of July speech was put out in a, he had that baby printed up before he even finished the speech and took it on the road and he sold it through his newspaper for something like a dollar 50 a copy and uh i don't know what was it 10 copies for five dollars or something like that he was a marketer and then other speeches later certain of them he had printed up in in a kind of a short pamphlet form to be distributed uh, this is the way the abolition movement um sold itself so to speak 
Um, uh, so he was, he was probably more known for some of the speeches than he was for some of the writings. However, one of the things I found, this was really quite stunning to me. He gets letters late in life, 1880s, early 1890s from people who will tell him about his autobiography, who will, who, will, who will mention they remember where they were when they read it back in 1848. They will remember a character, like one of the overseers. They will, they, as though they were remembering the characters of Uncle Tom's Cabin or something. Uh, readers who have read Douglas for years, and he has become sort of part of their mindset, part of their mentality through his writings. And I suspect that had uh, great satisfaction uh, for Douglas, um, because I think ab above, as I may have implied earlier, above everything else, Douglas wanted to be respected for this mm. as a writer. Um, and he was. And although his books largely went out of print for much of the 20th century, his narrative wasn't put back in print until 1960. Uh, my Bondage and My Freedom came back into print a little bit later. Uh, uh, Life and Times, the third autobiography, I think never went out of print, but it didn't mean it sold much. Um, so th there's been an extraordinary Douglas, you know, rediscovery and revival, uh, as you know, since the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and now he is widely taught and widely translated um, as this American voice. But I do think, you know, people will be here 100 years from now still talking about Douglas, but by and large, yes, they may talk about the heroic story of escape and all that, but mostly they'll be talking about his words. Mm -hmm. He lives on in his words. Well, Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for talking to us about this extraordinary 19th century American and, and also about, you know, what it felt and what has driven, uh, you know, to write the biography of this astounding man. Uh, we couldn't be more grateful that this evening, this event uh, eventually materialized as uh, uh, our colleagues have mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, we've been working on this for a long time. You were, you were very busy and, and we are so delighted that eventually, you know, we, we could do this. And in part, I have to say, uh, we would have to thank the pandemic and, you know, the new uh, uh, techno savvy generation that this actually, you know, happened. Uh, I want to thank once again, not just David, obviously, but of course, all the, you know, organizers and co-organizers and the uh, institutions, the various institutions, the BAA, the, the Yale Club, uh, Germany, uh, my department, uh, who have been involved in, in making this possible. And uh, David, you have a rain check, as we've discussed earlier, an open invitation, come back anytime, uh, you know, once we can travel again, uh, we would be truly delighted to welcome you and host you over here. And then we next would time in Munich, and right. we'll go to the Schneider House. Exactly. We would wine and dine you uh, as it behooves, you know, a, a true academic after the talk. Uh, so thanks again. And thanks all, to all of you out there for joining in tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. It's been a thrill for me. Thank you.